and they're in the back as well. You can put them there or just hand them to a member and they'll make sure that we get those. But we're so glad that your family has chosen to worship with us today. Let me remind you again, if you open your bulletin on the first page, page, the project Thank You, benefiting the Chattanooga Police Department, we are collecting those items this week, okay? We need to get those in. Uh, our church is the storage place for the entire city, so make sure that you bring those in. If you do bring them in tomorrow, make sure you get here before 12. Uh, we're closing the office tomorrow at 12, going to give our, our staff a little break after VBS, uh, but you can bring those in the rest of the week from 8.30 to 4.30 any day of the week. Um, we had a great week. It was just an awesome time. We had so many kids here. We're going to show a little video, and, uh, and then Danny and Pepper are going to come tell us more about VBS.
Hey. <laughs> I'm Danny, or Director Danny. Um, and this is Pepper. She was the behind the scenes director that you didn't see, but pretty much did everything. So she's awesome. <laughs> Um, so this week we did Australian themed Zoomerang VBS. Um, we learned about kangaroos, coral, who knew coral was a living organism? We did, we learned. Um, <laughs> we learned about koalas, dingoes, the outback Uluru Rock, the Great Barrier Reef, and underground cities. It was pretty awesome and the kids had an amazing time. Uh, at least that was my perception of it. What did you guys think? Did you kids have a good time? Okay, good. Um, our main verse this week was Psalm 139, 14. And it says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Um, so we wanted to focus on raising money for choices um, as we did that this week. And we originally set what we thought was a pretty high goal of $500 for the kids. And we were like, if you reach it, you're going to have this awesome glow party. And they reached it on Wednesday. <laughs> And we were completely blown away because we've never made that much money for any of our organizations before. So um, we challenged them to raise an additional 500 And if they did, they would win an ice cream party. And I'm not kidding. Those kids blew it out of the park. We raised $1,108 for choices this year. Also throughout the week, um, we started learning what was not money because every time kids were turning in money, <laughs> I was getting a lot of things that were not money. Um, some of my favorites, a waffle fry. Um, <laughs> we also got a full intact stink bug that was dead, um, but fully intact. Um, <laughs> uh, we found a rusty nail. We got expired Old Navy cash, um, macaroni, batteries, um, and then I have two more favorites. My personal favorite, I got some BFF beads. So someone out there is my BFF and I know who she is. Um, <laughs> and then my all-time favorite that I'm pretty sure we've never, ever, 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 ever gotten before was a silver tooth. So we're, we're still looking for someone to claim that. It, I think they might need to turn it into the tooth fairy. It's probably worth a lot. Um, <laughs> but it is not money. Definitely not money. Um, <laughs> and then I think the last takeaway um, from the very uh, last night, I think, was my personal favorite. Um, it talked about no matter what role in life you have, and it sort of questioned the kids, like, what's a more important job, being the head of a company or the worker in a cubicle or owning a restaurant or feeding homeless, being a TV broadcaster or a stay-at-home mom, a student or a sports star? And that was the trick. All of those roles are important, and no, none are better or worse if you're in the family of God. So wherever you are right now, God has pre prepared work ahead of time for you. And so our job through that is to love God and love others, think of God and think of others, and live for God and live for others. And that's straight from Ephesians 2, which is, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So I think the kids learned so much this week at VBS. I think the leaders had a great time, although maybe tired or more tired than the kids, but I think it was a successful week. And Pepper has a few other points and numbers for us before we call the kids up on stage to dance with us. Oh, I just wanted to let you know that we had 90 kids at VBS this week, which is amazing. And one thing that I really wanted to say was thank you to the leaders. We had 80 leaders 
either help us before, during, and probably after VBS as well. Um, they packed bags. They made meals for the leaders who were coming from work straight to VBS. They led kids through all the stations. They did the stations, crafts, science experiments, um, games, all of those things. We had so many people. And to me, the our verse of the week I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And we're telling the kids how valuable they are to God. But having that many people in our church come together just shows us that we value them too. And we believe that and we want them to know about God. So, (laughs) sorry, (laughs) kind of chokes me up every time. Um, So I just wanted to say thank you for investing your time and your energy. It really makes a difference. And You know, our culture tells all of our kids all these things, but for them to hear the truth about their value and their purpose and their worth to God, that's just amazing. And you made a big investment this week, and I'm just so thankful that 90 kids got to hear all that this week. Thank you. I didn't want to forget. Four. And... And we did have four that prayed to accept Christ as their savior this week. So that's amazing. <laughs> Thanks for telling me this <laughs> Okay, at this time, we want to invite all of our VBS kids up on stage so that we can dance to some of our favorite songs and show off what we learned this week.
kiddos. Thanks for joining us on stage. And thank you to Good morning. <laughs> Y'all go ahead and stand with us. We're going to go ahead and top of worship. Your name. 
Father God, we just lift your name this morning and thank you for these children who have come to lead us, God, and just your truth that rings true. And um, we just give you all the glory and all the praise and um, just be with us with your word and um, teach us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 139. Since I got a stick, I'm going to use this. So if I see you napping out there, I'm going to come by and whack you, okay? You know, God is worthy of our praise. God is worthy of our life, especially for us to surrender to Him. God is worthy of our praise. And as we look at Psalm 139, it's going to tell us exactly why. And what is interesting is you've already heard this is, was our uh, main focus verse, or one of these verses out of 139 for VBS. And it just got us so good. We planned this VBS long ago. We didn't know what was going to be going on in our nation during this time. But this was so significant that uh, we were teaching our children about how they are wonderfully and fearfully made. The first thing I want you to know as we look at this and why God is worthy of praise in Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6 tell us that we should praise Him because He is an omniscient God. It says, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is even on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. God is an omniscient God. That basically means that God sees all and God knows everything. What he's telling us here is that God has perfect knowledge about everything. In fact, there is nothing that God does not know. And what I love about David as he writes this is is this knowledge is a personal knowledge because David declares, you know me. You know me, God. God knew everything about David intimately. He knew when he sat down and he knew when he got up. He knew his thoughts even before he had them. He knew David when he went out and exactly what he was doing when he went out. But he also knew when he laid down and when he slept. He knew every word that was on his lips, 
And he even knew the true meaning about what he truly meant when he said each word. He knew every move that David made. He knew why David did, said, and thought whatever he did. I, I ran across an A.W. Tozier quote that I love. Listen to this. He said, God knows instantly and effortlessly all matter and all matters, all mind and every mind, all spirit and all spirits, all being and every being, all creaturehood and all creatures, every plurality and all pluralities, all law and every law, all relations, all causes, all thoughts, all mysteries, all enigmas, all feeling, all desires, every unuttered secret, all thrones and dominion, all personalities, all things visible and invisible in heaven and on earth, motion, space, time, life, death, good, evil, heaven and hell. Because God knows all things perfectly, he knows no thing better than any other thing, but all things equally well. He never discovers anything. He is never surprised, never amazed. He never wonders about anything, nor does he seek information or ask questions. God is an all-knowing God. You know what that includes? You and me. There is nothing about you that God does not already know. He knows everything you do. He knows every thought that you have even before you think it. He knows every motive of your heart, even if you don't know what the motive is behind what you do. He knows every sin that you ever commit. Everything you hide from somebody else is plain to him. He knows you intimately even better than you know yourself. Now, that can be a little frightening, can it? Knowing that God knows everything about us, and, and while we look around and we can kind of hide our sin and our pettiness from others and our failures and all the fallops that we have, and we can kind of hide all of that to others, we see our ugliness even when others don't, but listen to me, God sees it as well. And for someone who is not a believer in Jesus Christ, that they've never accepted what he did for them on the cross, they do not have a relationship with him, this is very threatening. Because when you look at the totality of it, and since he is the judge, and since you will stand before him at the end of time and have to give an account for your life, you're not going to be able to fool him because he knows everything you ever did, said, or thought. And that can be very threatening and very fearful. But it shouldn't be for a follower of Jesus Christ. Because what it means for us is this intimate knowledge. It shouldn't produce a fear, but a hope within us. To just think about how he knows us that intimately. He knows all of our failures and all of our sins, yet he still loves us. Yet he still sent his son to die on our behalf. And he still brings forgiveness to us. And he helps us every day in every way. We should see this not as a fear that he knows me, but we should see it as we should see him as a refuge to run to. You see, I, it means I can be completely open before him because he already knows it anyway. I can pour out my heart and all the trash that is in there and all my failures and maybe nobody else knows, but he does, and I can just pour it out to him. I don't have to try to hide it to him because he knows me that well. Psalm 32, 7 states this. He says, God, you are my hiding place. Because God is an omniscient God, let God be your hiding place. Don't run from him. Don't try to hide things from him. He knows it anyway. Be completely honest. Get it out there to him because he is an all-knowing God. We should praise him because he's an all-knowing God. Yes. Secondly, we should praise him because he is omnipresent. Look at verses 7 through 12. David writes and he says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, in Sheol, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light becomes night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. What he's telling us here is that God is universally present. God is everywhere at all times. There is nowhere 
where God is not. He can never, or we can never be without Him. We can never run away from Him, nor should we want to, for God has said in His Word, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know what that means? God is here right now. When you leave, God is going with you. Everywhere you go, God is there. And so David begins to think about it. He says, well, there, maybe there are three areas where God may not be. What about up or down? And he says, well, even if I go up even into the heavens, God's already there. If I go down into Sheol, God is there. David can never go too high to get away from God, but he can also never sink too low where God cannot reach him. David is always in God's presence. Well, what about east or west? Well, he concludes, David, if I rise with the sun in the east, God's there. If I go to the west where the sun sets, God is there. No matter how far David drifts or even runs from God, God is still there. And he says that God's hand is still even guiding me. God has still got a hold of me. He never lets David go, never. God holds on to him tightly. Well, what about darkness? Certainly God's not in the darkness. Then he has to conclude, even in the darkness, God is there. Even in darkness, God is there as a brilliant light, and when God shows up, the darkness has to flee. God is there, listen to me, in your dark times. God brought to my mind our widows and our widowers, and I know that your days seem dark without your spouse. This part of you that has died, and now you're such a lonely, and, and there's a darkness that is there, but I want to remind you that God is there, and he will light your way. God has not left you alone. His presence is there, and he will light your way. For those of you that your life right now is dark, maybe it's scary. Maybe as you're going through life right now, it just seems like you're losing so much. Your world is crashing down around you. God is there. You are never alone. You are never without because God is with you. He will never drop you. He will never leave you. He will never desert you. You have God with you. And for a believer, how liberating that is, how freeing that is, how comforting that is, but also how exhilarating that is, is that God is right here with me right now. God is worthy to be praised because he knows you intimately and he is with you always. But there's a third reason why we should praise God, and that's because he is omnipotent. Look at verses 13 through 18. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. You see, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Oh, how precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. God is an omnipotent God. That means he is all-powerful, which means this. There is nothing that God cannot do. And that means this, he is a sovereign God. That means he is in complete control. But as David thinks about this power, he, he realizes that it's not some inanimate, impersonal power. It is a very intimate power. In fact, he tells us here that God uses his power and his strength to create every one of us. Where? In our mother's womb. Now, let me just kind of veer here for just a minute. There's a lot in the news today about the abortion issue. And from my perspective, praise God for the Supreme Court decision. Amen. I am grateful that we are reducing that. I know that states still have the right to do what they want to, but I am glad for this decision, and here is why. Seems like the, the mantra of the, the pro-abortion faction is basically this. It is my body and I can do with it whatever I please. 
Their argument basically is that this baby or this fetus is kind of like another organ in their body, like a gallbladder or an appendix, and it's a part of her body, so she can remove it if she wants to. Folks, this is why you never hear the pro-abortion faction calling it a baby. They call it a fetus, an embryo, or a blob of tissue, not a baby. The reason is, it's not too hard to get rid of a blob of tissue. That does not sound that bad. But to get rid of a baby is a different story. And Scripture and even growing medical knowledge disputes this horrible, terrible reasoning. Did you know, and we say today, that if you have brain activity, you're alive. Did you know that brain activity within a baby starts before the woman even knows she's pregnant? Did you realize that the heart of a baby is being formed and has uh, blood circulation by the sixth week? From the moment of conception, there is an uninterrupted development of that child as cells begin to divide and they begin to multiply. And from that moment on, everything is growing and developing within that baby. This baby not only has its own organs and skin and limbs, did you realize that the baby in the womb also has its own DNA, which is separate from its mother? This baby is not a blob of tissue that can be removed. It is a living human being that deserves life, love, protection, a chance to live, and not death. Again, what Scripture tells us in this passage, God creates our inmost being. That inmost being alludes to He develops our mind and our heart and our will and our body all of it in the womb. In fact, the Hebrew text here uses in the secret place and the depths of the earth. Those were alluding to are a way of saying in the womb. So in the womb, this is all happening. We are not a blob of haphazard tissue. We are purposely put together by God in the womb. In fact, it says that he knits us together. It says that we are woven together by God himself. And the picture that he gives us here is of a skilled craftsman creating something beautiful and purposeful. It is the picture of a true artist creating a masterpiece. And we learned that this week from our kids, that he creates a masterpiece that is unique and special. And he does all of this in the womb. In fact, in verse 16, he says that his eyes saw my unformed body. So even before our body is formed, God sees us as a person. He knows us even before our body is being formed. And that means that we are alive. It means that we are a person, not just tissue. We are wonderfully and we are fearfully made. That phrase means that we are made with wonder and purpose and delight. It means that every one of us are extraordinary. We are remarkable. We are awesome. We are unique, and we are miraculous. We are special, every one of us. And God does it all in the womb. He creates a precious masterpiece in every pregnancy, and that includes you. Listen to me, children, young people, there is no one else like you. You are unique. You are wonderful just the way God created you. And as you grow up, God gives you your height. Some of us are short. Some of us are tall. He gives us the hair color that we have. And whether you have straight hair or curly hair or whether you have hair or no hair. Ah, some of y'all got that. (laughs) This is what God did to my head. But he did it, and that's okay. He gives us our physical characteristics. He gives us our personality, our abilities, even the way we walk, our intellect. And, please listen to me, he even creates our gender. God gave you your gender. It is who you are. Please, young people, do not be fooled by those who want to confuse you and use you for their agenda. 
God gave you your gender in his perfect knowledge, and God does not make mistakes. Your gender is not a mistake. And why would anyone want to change who God created them to be in his perfection? You are who you are because God knit you together that way. He created you just the way you are. You are wonderful. You are unique. You are miraculously woven together. So don't try to be like someone else, and don't try to be what somebody else tells you you should be. Be you, created in the image of God. Ephesians 2.10 says, For you are God's work of art, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. You become the best you in Jesus Christ. And I can't encourage you enough, if you don't have a relationship with him, that's where it begins. It begins by giving your heart and life to Jesus Christ, going to him and saying, God, I know there are things wrong in my life. I have committed sin, but I know that you are perfect. I know that you came here, you taught us, but not only did you live, you died, and you did it for a purpose. And I love the way that Zach put it. It said, when they buried him, our sin was buried with him. And when he rose from the dead, that sin was still in the grave. And when we accept him, that sin stays in the grave and we are resurrected like that resurrection power that we talked about. You become God's work of art in Jesus Christ. So how should we respond? Well, look at verses 19 through 23. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Two things I see here. Number one, I think he's challenging us to do this. Stay away from evil. Don't hang with evil run from it. Don't get caught up in wrong and destructive habits and ways. Please hear me. It will mess you up, and it will take you far from God. Stay away from evil. But I think he's also encouraging us here, fight against wrong. And even in today's scenario, I think as believers in Jesus Christ, we are to fight for life. We cannot become passive and do nothing. We must fight for what is right, and we cannot back down. Now, please do not get me wrong here. That does not mean for you to get on Facebook and start lamb blasting somebody else. Always remember that our enemy is not another human being. There's a spiritual power against us. We are fighting against a system. We're fighting against a power, not another human being. Do not sit there and demean another human being, but stand strong for what is right. There is a fine line, I know, but be very careful and be very gracious as you do it, but do not be scared to speak the truth in love. Secondly, stay away from evil, fight against wrong, But let God in. Give him all of you. Let him search you so that he can know you. Then trust him to do what is best for you. Why should you? Because he created you. And he knows you better than anyone else, better than you even know yourself. So don't run from him. Don't try to hide from him. Instead, run to him. Be taken over by the greatness of God, and don't let anything or anyone stand in the way or endanger your walk with God. God is all-knowing and worthy to be praised. God is present everywhere and worthy to be praised. God is all-powerful. He created you in the womb with wonder and purpose, and he should be worshiped and praised. 
He is worthy of your praise. He is worthy of your life. So give it to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you're doing in our midst. God, thank you for this past week. Lord, VBS was awesome. God, to see all these kids around here and to see the joy in their life and on their face and to know that four of them gave their heart to to you. They became a follower of Jesus Christ. We rejoice in that, God. Thank you that our kids heard this week the truth, that they are wonderfully and fearfully made just the way they are, created by you. And we praise you for that, God. And I pray that we all hear that same message today. Let everyone know that they are wonderfully and fearfully made. They were made with a purpose. They are unique. And God, you want to be in their life. You want to have a relationship with them so that they can become all that they were created to be in you. And I pray for those individuals here today, from the youngest to the oldest, who has never surrendered their life to you, that today would be the day that you would work in their heart and draw them to yourself. And God, I thank you as a believer in life. Lord, I keep hearing a lot of people saying, well, you Christians just believe in birth, but not life. No. God, I am so proud of our church that we are not only fight for the baby in the womb, but God, we have a a, a group of ladies that come from our children's home that we pour our lives into. Lord, we have families in our church that have adopted kids. We have many that are fostering children because they care not just about the baby, but the entire life. God, may we always be about life. And I pray, God, that we would make a difference in the hearts of our children and our young people and every adult. God, take over. Do what you want to during this time. God, I pray as we sing this song, Run to the Father. God, I pray that we would have people running to you. Lord, during this invitation, Lord, I pray that no one would be ashamed to come forward and say, I need Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Or to say, I have recently invited Jesus Christ into my heart, and I want to make it public. I am not ashamed to let others know that I am born again in Jesus Christ. Maybe some just need to to run to the Father and get on their knees or on their face before God and just give their heart to it. Oh, Lord, make a difference in our people. Help us to run to you right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. If you need to make a decision, come and pray. You do that this morning right now. Yeah.
Tim, stand with me. Don and Amy have been visiting with us for about three decades now. And uh, no, just kidding. They have been a delight. The whole family and the other girls are already in college. Amy's going to be heading to school here pretty soon. But they really believe that, that they are to be a member here. And so they come this morning saying that we're transferring our letter. want to be a part of the body of Christ here. And they are serving so much. Dawn was here every night this week. She pours into kids on Wednesday night. Amy as well. They're a delight. If you would agree with their decision to be a part of the family of God here at Oakwood, would you say amen? Amen. amen. God bless y'all. We're so excited to have y'all. All right. Benjamin and Paulina and Horatio. Benjamin and Paulina just uh, moved a few months ago from Alaska and... Uh, uh, he is going through the, what do they call police academy? And uh, here in Chattanooga, it's going to be a uh, policeman for the Chattanooga Police Department. Uh, Paulina is a stay-at-home mom, and they are coming this morning to be a part of our church. Paulina is coming on statement of her faith in Jesus Christ and will follow in the waters of baptism. And uh, Benjamin is coming to uh, as a transfer of letter from a church in Alaska. So what if you would agree with their decisions to be a part of the family of God and a ratio as well? Would you say amen? Yeah. Amen. God bless you. I'm so glad to have you. Y'all, y'all stay up here. Stay up here. Dawn and Amy, y'all come stand with them as well. Y'all come by, give them the right hand of fellowship, introduce yourselves to them, give them your name, and then next week we'll test them to see how many names they can know. Just kidding. Not going to do that. Anyway, yeah, let's stand together as we close. I think Lane Keith, where is Lane? Lane, come lead us in our benediction prayer, brother. And then y'all come by and greet them. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you revealed yourself to us as the omnipotent, all-knowing, all-powerful God. And that through our Lord and Savior, Jesus, we can be part of your family. We pray that uh, we've been challenged today and that we would go out into the world this week and be the salt and the light that you want us to be and that we manifest the agape of our Lord and Savior Jesus to everyone we meet. In his name we pray. Amen.